Christ. As we turn in our Bibles, I invite you to turn for our Old Testament reading to Psalm 18. To Psalm 18, same passage that we just sung. If you have one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 455. Psalm 18, and we'll read verses 31 to 50. And then we'll turn to the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 6. So Psalm 18, starting at verse 31, this is a Psalm of David. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supported me and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back till they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise and they fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like mire in the streets. You delivered me from the strife with the peoples. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above all those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. And sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king. And shows steadfast love to his anointed. To David and his offspring. Forever. And again, as I just said. Pointing prophetically, the kingdom of David was a type. Was a picture, ultimately, of the spiritual kingship of Jesus Christ. And we rejoice in Christ's victory. Now let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Again, if you have a pew Bible, it's on page 979. Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll read verses 10 to 20, but our focus for the sermon will be on uh, verses 10 through 13. So Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly 
as I ought to speak. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Again, our text is verses 10 through 13. Proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. And let the weak say, I am a warrior. These words come from the Old Testament book of Joel. And they describe the end times and the great day of judgment. And they are words that have always stirred and energized me. From the time I was young, I always wanted to live for something that required sacrifice, something that required courage. I wanted a kingdom to build. I wanted a cause to live for, something that was worth living for and something that was worth dying for. When I was a teenager, God in his grace brought me to see that, considered from one aspect, Christianity is really the ultimate fulfillment of these very things. It is a glorious kingdom to live for, not waged with physical weapons, not waged against human enemies, but a battle that is waged with the spiritual weapons of truth and love and prayer and praise. A battle against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, as Paul says. Really, this idea of warfare, spiritual warfare, captures an important aspect of the Bible's description of the Christian life and of the calling of the church. As we continue in our study of the book of Ephesians, Paul comes this afternoon to this very subject, to what we might call the spiritual warfare of the Christian life. We're getting very close to the end of the letter to the Ephesians, and Paul, in a sense, is, is beginning here to bring about the awesome conclusion to this book. In the first three chapters, as Paul set forth the, the wonder of God's grace, all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ to save us from sin, as he was setting that forth in the first three chapters, Paul mentioned the reality of spiritual warfare and spiritual forces several times. He spoke in chapter 1 of how Christ and his ascension has been raised above all rule and authority and power and dominion. In chapter 2, he mentioned that before we came to Christ, we were enslaved and we served the prince of the power of the air, who is the devil. And in chapter 3, he mentioned that the purpose of the church is to showcase the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That was one of Paul's focuses in the first three chapters. But as Paul came to chapter 4, and he shifted his, focus, shifted his focus to the practical aspects of the Christian life. How should we respond to God's grace? Since that point, Paul has been focusing the vast majority of his attention upon the Christian's conflict with the world and with the sin in his own heart. But now as Paul is about to wrap up his letter, he brings the minds of these believers back to this great overarching spiritual conflict that Christians have with the satanic forces of evil. Now we live in what is often called a scientific age. We live in a scientific world. And it's full of skepticism regarding the existence of spiritual, personal spiritual beings. You talk to people on the streets, almost everyone will acknowledge the existence of evil in the abstract. But if you start talking about a personal devil who is the very embodiment of evil, or if you tar start talking about personal satanic forces that are seeking to deceive and destroy, people will, will probably look at you like you're crazy. Science has disproved all that, hasn't it? The truth is, living in this kind of an atmosphere, this kind of a world of unbelief, can very easily begin to impact Christians, impact the church. And so there is the temptation of Christians in the Western world to, to begin to live by sight and to forget the fact that there is a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare going on. Well, the Bible unashamedly teaches that God is supernaturally at work in the world. The Bible is unashamed in proclaiming the very real existence of a spiritual realm 
and spiritual beings who are interacting with us constantly. And so as Paul gets into this passage, he uses the metaphor of a Roman soldier. And in essence, he's saying to Christians, he's saying, Christians, don't forget the existence of these spiritual forces and don't forget the character, the nature of Christian warfare. Christianity's advance in the world, the kingdom of God, is not just a battle of ideologies and thinking and worldviews and moral codes. And it's certainly not a human battle waged with physical weapons. It is a spiritual battle. But the enemy is very, very real. And he is powerful and he is cunning and he is malicious. We need to be aware of this. Because if we lose sight of the nature of our warfare, then we're going to start casting ourselves on fleshly tactics and weapons. If we forget that our enemy is spiritual, then we will start acting like the battle is of the flesh. And Paul would certainly want to keep us from that and cast us upon the strength that only God can supply. Well, this afternoon, we're just going to look at verses 10 to 13. Paul's argument here is really stretching from verses 10 to 20, but we're only going to focus on... Uh, Verses 10 to 13 this afternoon. In verses 10, Paul issues what I'm calling a a call to arms to Christians. And then in verse 11 to 13, he reminds us of the cosmic spiritual warfare in which we are engaged. And throughout it all, Paul keeps on coming back again and again to emphasize that because of the nature of our warfare, it is absolutely essential that we look to Christ for strength and to Christ for equipping. So first then in verse 10, we have a call to arms. A call to arms. Look at verse 10. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I think many of us are familiar with this passage. It's a well-known passage. What often happens with well-known passages is that we can forget the context. See, we need to remember that Paul has just been dealing with the Christian in the ordinary relationships of life. How are wives and husbands supposed to interact? How are children and parents supposed to interact? How are servants and masters supposed to interact as Christians? The point is, we can't separate this idea of spiritual warfare from that context. As Paul issues this call to arms to Christians, he recognizes that the battlefield upon which it is fought is first and foremost in the home, in the family, in the marriage, and in the workplace. You see, Paul is saying that even as we are involved in these ordinary relationships and activities of life, the Christian must never lose sight that underneath all of this, there is a great spiritual warfare being waged around him and upon him. And brothers and sisters, it is in this context more than anywhere else, that we need to be strong in the Lord. Because it's here, in the marriage, in the home, in the workplace, it's here that the devil will lay his snares, throw his darts, and seek to stir up sin. It's certainly true that if we go out on the streets and we share the gospel, or if we run into our neighbor and we find out that they're involved in the occult, or if we go on the mission field and we run into a demon-possessed person, we are most definitely involved in spiritual warfare in those instances. But the devil knows that if he can trip us up in the home, in the marriage, in the workplace, he doesn't really have to worry about our effectiveness in those other things. Spiritual warfare begins here in the ordinary relationships of life. Well, Paul begins then by issuing what I am calling a call to arms. He says, finally, after all that I have said, don't forget this. Be strong, Christian. This is a rousing, stirring call for the Christian to rise up and to go forth to battle. It's a spiritual trumpet blast to believers who easily find themselves becoming sleepy spiritually, becoming careless in our faith. One of the commentators that I read this week noted That as Christians, we often talk about the church as a hospital. It's not a place for the spiritually strong, but it's a place where the spiritually weak, those who are helpless, can come and find healing. There's a wonderful truth to that fact. 
for that, um, that image. We're reminded here that we need to hold that image side by side with this image of the church as a barracks, a place where spiritually weak people are made strong, where we are equipped for battle. And all through scripture, there is a call for Christians to have courage, to stand firm in the faith, to go forth to the battle, counting the cost. As I quoted earlier from Joel, stir up the mighty men. Let the men of war draw near. It calls forth the image of David's mighty men, doesn't it? One of, probably as a young teenager, one of my favorite passages. David's mighty men. As they went forth, following David to battle, facing insurmountable odds. And yet going forth with courage out of love for their king. And this is what Paul is saying. Be strong, Christian. Be of good courage. There is a battle to be waged. There is a war to win. There is an enemy to be overcome. Rise up, Christian, and go forth to war. Now, Paul is going to go on to talk about the equipment that God has provided for us in Christ. But if you have a soldier, he might have state-of-the-art equipment. He might have the strongest armor. He might have the best of weapons. But if that soldier lacks the courage and the willingness to actually engage in the fight, all the armor in the world is going to do no good. So Paul begins with this call to courage. Be strong. But of course there's a problem, isn't there? You and I might hear that call, be strong. And yet we might be stirred by it, and yet very quickly we might recognize, if we have any kind of spiritual awareness, we might recognize we're quite weak in ourselves. We are vulnerable in ourselves. Paul says, be strong. And yet we look at ourselves and we say, but we're weak. We don't have spiritual armor. We don't have spiritual strength. And of course, Paul knows this. And so he directs us right off the bat to the source of our strength. How do we be strong? He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And scripture does this all the time, doesn't it? 16 times, at least in the Old Testament, in one way or another, God's people are commanded to be strong and courageous. 27 times they're told to fear not. But again and again, the reason that is attached to those calls is, for I am with you, says the Lord. We're not strong in ourselves, we're strong in him. And that's what we find Paul saying here. He's reminding us that Christ our king has been raised to the highest place. And he said in chapter 1 that he's been given all might, all power, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to Christ. And so as Paul turns to Christians and he's saying, be strong, be courageous. He says, look to your king. He has all of power, all authority. Look to him. Not in your own strength, be strong. Be strong in his strength. Draw all the grace from him. Well, that's our call to arms, to cur have courage, Christian, and go forth to battle. And if we have any sense of the warfare that is before us, we recognize it will require great courage to answer this call. But if we have any sense of the source of our strength, we recognize we can have great, great confidence as we answer it. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, Paul moves on from that general, general exhortation, and he goes on to explain more fully the, the nature of our warfare. And so in verses 13 to our sorry, verses 11 to 13, he describes our cosmic spiritual warfare. Our cosmic spiritual warfare. Look at verses 11 to 13. He says, Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, 
having done all, to stand firm. So Paul in these verses is really expanding upon his exhortation and describing the nature of our warfare. And as he does, we see that what lays at the heart of what Paul is calling for is for us to stand firm in the faith. The key word is stand. Paul says, put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand. In verse 13, he repeats the same idea. Take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, Christian. You're going to be attacked. You're going to be assailed by the darkness. And you need strength to stand, to withstand, to stand firm. So Paul gives the command then to take up the whole armor of God because this is how we can stand. There's no other way to stand except in the armor of God. However, right in between those two commands, Paul says that in verse 11 and verse 13. Take the armor of God. This is how you will stand. But right in between, Paul states why we need the armor of God. And so what I want to do is I simply want to look first at the nature of our enemy and then at the nature of our armor. The nature of our enemy and then the nature of our armor. In a very real sense, it's the nature of the enemy that is the focus of this passage. Because it's the nature of our enemy that is the great reason that undergirds all the commands that Paul gives us here. And so let's start by looking at what Paul says our enemy is not, and then at three things that show us what our enemy is. So Paul says in verse 12, he says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, the phrase flesh and blood in the New Testament refers to humanity. Specifically, it refers to mankind as a creature of the physical earth. So Paul is saying our battle is not against men. It's not against humanity, even fallen humanity as such. It's not a physical battle. We don't convert people by the point of the sword. Our goal as Christians is never to destroy people. But as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, it's to destroy arguments. It's to cast down opinions that raise themselves against the knowledge of Christ. It's to bring thoughts and minds and hearts to surrender and obedience to Christ. And so when we look at other people, we look at them not with hostility, but with compassion. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Of course, if our battle is not against flesh and blood, well, what is it against? What is our enemy? Paul highlights three things. First, in verses 11, he notes that our enemy has evil schemes. That he has evil schemes. He says, put on the armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. I already mentioned, but scripture from beginning to end declares very clearly the existence of a personal devil, the prince of darkness. Scripture repeatedly shows us that one of the things that characterizes him is craftiness. We saw that right back at the Garden of Eden. The devil is the tempter. He's the accuser of the brethren. And scripture describes him as prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he is constantly, the devil is constantly scheming against the people of God and against the kingdom of Christ. How can I bring them down? How can I lure them away from Christ? How can I distract them? How can I divide them? How can I render them ineffective? Brothers and sisters, I just want to say there is something truly terrifying about that if we stop and ponder it. That the captain of our spiritual enemy is not stupid. And he's not playing fair. He is constantly seeking to deceive and to confuse. And he is wise. He has thousands of years of experience in exploiting weakness and deceiving men and women. Scripture gives us actually many examples of the devices that that the devil uses. He'll misquote scripture. To make us rationalize our sin. Haven't you heard that? Someone living in sin. Yeah, but scripture says 
you know, it's all about love. And so I'm going to go commit adultery because I'm just following my heart of love. Misquoting scripture. The devil will disguise himself as an angel of light to lead us from the truth. He'll mix error with just a little bit of truth to make it sound very plausible and convincing. He'll even convince people that he doesn't exist. He'll misrepresent the character of God to keep people from him. Dear Christian, you need to remember, you have an enemy who is far smarter than you, and he is using all of his skills to make you stumble and fall. And if you recognize that, you recognize that you need the armor of God. You cannot outwit him on your own. So Paul makes clear then that we face an enemy who has evil schemes. However, secondly, in verse 12, Paul also highlights that our enemy has evil armies. Evil armies. Look at verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Paul is here describing the forces of the evil one. We have a devil with evil strategies, but he also have hope, has evil hosts that do his bidding. And the hosts of darkness are a well-ordered, well-equipped, and numerous army. And Paul gives us a list, really, of things that characterize these satanic forces. He says they are the rulers. That is, they are high in rank. They are the authorities. They have dominion and power over people and over things. They're cosmic powers over this present darkness. That is to say they hold power in this present evil age, this world marked by ignorance and ungodliness. My friends, we need to recognize this present world, the world in which we are living, is not neutral to Jesus Christ. It is hostile to him. It is being ruled over by cosmic powers of evil. And make no mistake about it. There are satanic forces that are influencing institutions, religions, philosophies, movements, entertainment, education. Everything in our world that is, that is calculated to overthrow the truth of God and blind us to the glory of God in Jesus Christ is being influenced by the powers of darkness. The powers of darkness take so many souls captive and blind them to see the glory and the love of Jesus Christ. Paul also describes them as spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is, they're spiritual forces. They dwell in the heavenly realms and they are evil through and through. I don't want to trivialize it, but it kind of has in your mind, picture the hordes of Sauron in the Lord of the Rings. A vile, dark, wicked host led by a dark lord, and they are vicious, ugly, malignant beasts, and they are set on one thing only, the destruction of everything that is good, everything that is righteous, everything that is godly, and everything that is holy. Brothers and sisters, this is what our battle is against. Behind the scenes of human history, there is a battle that is going on for the minds and the hearts and the souls of men. And sometimes it breaks out in very obvious, overt ways. When the occult gains influence in our world, when, when governments and nations rise up and viciously persecute Christians. But other times it's very secret, it's very cloaked. When children's movies begin to subtly indoctrinate our kids against biblical truth. When unbiblical philosophies begin to determine how we raise our children. When under the banner of love, a society begins to set aside God's law. Yet behind it all, we need to recognize there is this cosmic spiritual battle that is raging. And Paul highlights the armies of the evil one to emphasize one thing. If this is the nature of our enemy, if it is the spiritual hosts of evil with power and authority in the world, brothers and sisters, we cannot hope to stand firm 
unless we are equipped with spiritual weapons of righteousness, unless we are clothed in the whole armor of God. And Paul notes one more thing. He notes that our enemy has spiritual, our evil schemes. He has evil forces. But then in verse 13, Paul also notes that our enemy attacks in what he calls the evil day. He calls believers to put on the armor of God and he says, so that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And for us to understand what the evil day is, we need to think again about Satan's weapons. How does Satan wage war against the Christian? How does he attack? Well, Scripture shows us that there are three main weapons that Satan uses against Christians. We actually see these fairly clearly laid out in the book of Revelation. First, he attacks with deception. Deception. By which he seeks to lead our minds away from the truth. He also attacks with persecution by which he tries to break our wills so that we'll deny Christ. And then third, he attacks us with seduction, by which he tries to draw our affections away from Jesus and onto worldly, sinful pleasures and pursuits. And so the evil day, when Paul talks about the evil day, it really refers to any time in which one or more of these things is being used against us with particular power and pressure. So times of deception would be times when heresy is entering in the church and we have to decide whether we're going to stand against it or embrace it. Times of persecution come when you are faced with the realization, if I confess Christ in this situation, I am going to suffer. Times of seduction are when the pull, the pull of sin is so strong and there's great pressure to yield to it. It was an evil day for David when he saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof. It was an evil day for Peter when he was asked by a servant girl if he would deny Christ. It was an evil day for Stephen when he was dragged before the Sanhedrin. It was an evil day for the Galatians when the Judaizers were coming in and telling them that if they were circumcised, they, they had to be circumcised to be saved. See, so the evil day is the day of testing. The day when the pressure is great, the day when we feel weak, and the day when darkness seems so strong in one way or another. I want to bring your mind back to something I said earlier. Remember the context. Brothers and sisters, the evil day will come upon us more likely than not within the context of ordinary relationships. It might take place more broadly on a larger scale in society, but more often than not, the first place that it will begin to face us is in the context of our marriages, our families, our children, our workplaces, even in the context of the church. When lies come to lead us astray, when seduction comes to lead us away from faithfulness, and when persecution comes, and even our own family members say, we want nothing more to do with you unless you turn away from Jesus. It's in the context of ordinary relationships that the pressure of the evil day will come. And brothers and sisters, I want to ask you, when this day comes upon you, will you be strong? Will you stand or will you fall? Paul is saying you will fall unless you are clothed in the full armor of God unless every part of you is protected by spiritual armor, unless you are relying upon Christ and all that he has given to us in the gospel. And as we think about the nature of our enemy in this spiritual warfare, that's what Paul wants us to see. He wants to emphasize this one thing, that we are no match for this enemy, that we cannot fight him on our own. We're like a group of children with sticks and stones trying to pull, push the armies of Russia out of the Ukraine. And to put it in a biblical metaphor, we are like a little servant boy with a sling and a stone standing up against a nine-foot-tall giant who has been trained in warfare from his youth. And that's what Paul wants us to face. Face the fact, Christian, your enemy is far, far stronger than you, far wiser, 
far more crafty. Because it's this realization that shows us the absolute necessity that we be clothed in the whole armor of God. Well, that brings us then briefly to look at the nature of our armor. Okay, if this is our enemy, how can we stand? Paul says we need to put on the armor of God. Now, in the next sermon, as we go on in the chapter from verse 14, we're going to look at each specific piece of armor that Paul sets forth. But I just want to briefly note two things about this armor. First, I want you to note that it is complete armor. It's complete armor. He says the whole armor of God. The Greek word is the Greek uh, for panoply. And it means the complete equipment of a heavily armed soldier. Now, it's only one word in the Greek, but it speaks of a completeness, of a fully attired suit of armor. See, what we need to recognize, what Paul wants us to recognize, is that in Christ, God has given us absolutely everything we need to stand firm in the faith, faith against the assaults of evil. And Christ has given us everything we need. And we need all of it. King Ahab was killed when he went into battle disguised. And it says a certain man drew his bow at random. And it struck Ahab between his scale armor and his breastplate. And he died. Found one little chink in his armor, a random shot, and he died. My friend, Satan does not shoot his darts at random. He's a skilled marksman. And he takes careful aim. And if we are not clothed in all the armor, if there's a chink in our armor, Satan will find it. So he says we cannot leave anything out. We need all the armor of God. But second, notice that this armor is also divine armor. Paul says it is the armor of God. That is to say it is armor that is given to us as a gift of God's grace. I want you to notice that all the things that Paul names here as he goes on are things that are given to us by grace in Christ. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the word of God. These are things that are divine in their origin and they are freely given to us in our union with Christ. And this is the great point. That at the end of the day, Paul wants us to realize that everything we need is laid up for us in Christ. In a very real sense, Christ himself is our armor. Paul says in Romans 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to obey its desires. Put on Christ. And brothers and sisters, in this cosmic spiritual warfare, it is as we drift away from Christ that we find ourselves vulnerable to the attacks of the evil one. We must stay close to Jesus, to our King. He is the one, as Psalm 18 says, who trains us for war, who equips us with strength for the battle. Dear Christians, stay close to Jesus Christ because in Him is all that you need to stand firm against the assaults of the evil one. And if you are here and you don't know Jesus Christ, this is a reminder that you are very vulnerable to the attacks of the evil one. He will lead you about howsoever he chooses with his deception. It might look very different for different people, but you are very, very vulnerable to the deceptions of Satan. And you need to realize the only way you will escape and find safety is by putting your faith in Jesus alone. Come to Christ. And in Christ you will find rest and freedom for your soul. Well, may God give us eyes to see the spiritual warfare in which we are involved. May God give us the courage to answer the call and be strong in the day of battle. But may God also give us the humility to see our great weakness and our great vulnerability so that we would be turned from ourselves and we would cast ourselves on the strength of Christ 
alone. Amen. Let us pray. Our glorious God in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you for his mercy. We thank you for his grace. We thank you for all that he has given, Lord. It is so glorious to know that we are not left to our own strength in this spiritual battle but that we have a mighty king who has all authority in heaven and on earth, and he stands to defend us. Gracious God, I pray that you would make your church spiritually strong, that we might advance in this world. And God, I pray that many who are ensnared in darkness, who are lost without the knowledge of Christ, might come to see his glorious salvation. Help us, Lord, to be your witnesses in Windsor, and to be faithful as we stand firm in the kingdom of Christ, in the midst of a world that is so strongly opposing you and opposing your truth. We love you. We thank you for this day of worship. Go with us into this week, Lord, and help us to walk with our Savior in faith and in love. And we pray in his name.